there was this moment where I kind of had this intellectual entree into this work when I was in graduate school. I was at NYU working on my PhD in history. It was 1998, and I remember the day. I was in a cubicle in the library, and at the time I was studying social movements looking at during the 20th century. And I was particularly interested in the um, power movements of the late 60s and the 70s. And I was studying um, at that time, reading about the Black Panthers. Who's heard of the Black Panthers? OK. Let me just. What are some of the perceptions that people have when they hear about the Black Panthers? You know, just shout some things out. Uh, violence. violence, of course. <laughs> Militant, misrepresented. Militant, misrepresented. Frightened or frightening? Frightened, Framed, OK. <laughs> they make great hot sauce. Great hot sauce. Didn't know about that. Um, <laughs> so, so there are many of these popular perceptions that the media presented about the Black Panthers that I had even taken on myself. These crazy, gun-toting radicals that were spewing a lot of rhetoric and not doing a lot of work. And the, when I got a chance to really delve more into the, the work and understand what they were doing, I realized that this was uh, the function of the media was to vilify them. And they were doing many meaningful programs that all came under the rubric of their survival programs. And I read about many of them, and they had many, you know, everything from teaching, because they really felt that people living in low-income communities, marginalized communities, communities of color needed to be self-sufficient. So they were teaching um, everything from, you know, how to cobble shoes, how to, um, you know, fix your toilet when it was broke. Uh, they had, you know, free testing for uh, sickle cell anemia, a problem that was, you know, plaguing or African Americans, uh, I guess, are the, the um, I don't even know if anybody, Doc, does anyone else besides African Americans get sickle cell anemia? <laughs> um, well, but you know, um, clearly there's an exponential or um, a disparity in the rates of sickle cell anemia in African American communities. So they were just doing all this meaningful work, but their free breakfast for children program was the um, project that resonated the most with me today. And I saw that they had this analysis that looked at the intersection between poverty, malnutrition, and institutional racism. And they were clear, one thing that they were clear about is that in order for communities of color to be liberated, they need to be educated. Education was a key to liberation and just to being self-sufficient. And they argued that young African-American kids couldn't possibly learn if they were going to school hungry. So with the help of a sympathetic preacher in West Oakland, California, they started this program in 1967, I believe. And within one year, they were feeding over 10,000 young people across the nation because other chapters of the project replicated this model. And there was, it was simple. We just want to feed young black kids so that they can go to school and learn. So I heard about that. I heard about their grocery giveaways, you know, thinking about bring, they were bringing groceries and food into communities and allowing residents, denizens of the community to come in and get food. And so it, it, it stuck in the back of my mind but it wasn't until I left graduate school and I was working for a citywide organization called the Citizens Committee for New York City. Now, I was a training and technical assistance coordinator, and I was charged with going to different community-based organizations throughout the five boroughs and to give training and technical assistance to these youth not-for-profits that were working with young people around youth development, youth organizing, and youth leadership. And it was very apparent to me that these programs were remiss if they didn't talk about consumption, food, you know, all these issues that were just basic to young people's survival and existence. And I would go into these projects and I would look at the young people and many of them, you know, there were these very just kind of visible signs that they were having issues with what they were eating from overweight to obesity to acne to lethargy to hyperactivity, all these issues that I was clear because of my own personal work around diet and nutrition. Um, were connected with what the young people were eating. And when I walked into the communities, I saw that there were two issues at play. One, there was ignorance on, among the young people and the staff. They just weren't um, very knowledgeable about the connection between diet and health and about these food issues. But I think the bigger problem was lack of access. You know, I've had the privilege of living in 
nice neighborhoods and, you know, affluent neighborhoods where I've always had access to healthy food. I've always had been in proximity to farmers markets. But I would see that these were these food deserts, as I mentioned earlier, where young people, where people in the communities had very little access to any fresh food, let alone organic, sustainable food. But there was a plethora of you know, ways of getting the worst food. So, you know, fast food restaurants on every corner, corner stores replete with highly processed um, foods with sugar, salt, fat, additives, all these things that were detrimental to their health and very few things with nutrients that were essential to, you know, people being healthy. And so I started Be Healthy this not-for-profit organization, and it's an acronym that I could, you know, it's funny, I was just like, be healthy, because there was this um, hip-hop song that came out in the late 90s by this group, Dead Prez, and it was all about, you know, people talk about hip-hop, gangster rap, and all this, and negative blight on civilization, but this song was all about eating healthy, you know, it's like, you are what you eat, so I strive to eat healthy, I eat lentil soup, and all this, and I was like, okay, so this is the, the name that I wanted to um, give to the organization, but then the young people actually came up with this acronym. They were like, we, we should make it an acronym. Well, they didn't say acronym, but they said, we should make it, you know, a name for each letter in the word. So how about build healthy eating and lifestyles to help youth? I promise you, I cried. Like, I couldn't have come up with a more brilliant name. And so the young people um, came up with this name, and there are a couple reasons that I wanted to start the organization. One, I, I want to address this issue that I saw with community-based organizations that were working with young people but didn't talk about these issues, at least being sympathetic to them and, at best, folding some type of nutrition, food, and farming programming into their existing projects around organizing youth leadership or what have you. Um, secondly, I understood very quickly that it's one thing for me to be up here or to be in front of a group of young people talking, uh, but when there are other young people who have learned about these issues, had a genuine transformation, and are up here talking passionately about these issues, that's transformative for other young people to see that.